Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. April, oh, oof, going fast. We're about almost halfway through April, uh, which is kind of exciting. We've had a ton of events already this month and a lot more coming up. If you visit exploringbytheseat.com, you can find all the events we have coming up to register for your classrooms, including a ton of events. We're on a coast-to-coast-to-coast road trip. Uh, with Parks Canada and visiting national parks all across Canada. So do check that out. We have a ton of events this month and next month. You won't want to miss them. So this month, we also have a little theme of climate change going. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, human activity is changing our planet and it's changing it very quickly. Uh, We've talked to scientists, we've talked to explorers, we've talked to people, filmmakers, Uh, and photographers who are documenting change around the world as we do try to study it, as we try to look for solutions, and of course document and share with the public what's happening around the planet. And I can't think of a better group to join us today than Hearts in the Ice. So today uh, we're going to be joined by Sunra Sorby uh, from Hearts in the Ice. Hilda Strom is not going to join us live today, but they are two seasoned polar ambassadors and citizen scientists. Hearts in the Ice was created in 2018 as a platform for social engagement to connect students, scientists, manufacturers, environmental organizations, and all who care about the health of our planet to create a big conversation around climate change and ways we can all be part of the solution. So if you've been with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for a while, you know the last several years we have followed Hilda and Sunva as they spent time, 18 months in fact, living in a remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu in Svalbard, so in Norway, located 140 kilometers from their nearest neighbor. So climate change isn't taking a break and neither are they. Since they've been back, they've been building new programs, they've been doing live events, they've been traveling and speaking at places around the world, all so we can continue raising uh, our voices and raising awareness about climate change. So joining us from Norway today, I'm going to bring in Sunova. Hey, Sunova, how are you doing today? Hi, Joe. Can you believe I'm flying solo today? <laughs> it, I don't think we've had an event where, you know, you and Hilda have not been together. Sometimes you're in separate locations, but I think this is the first flying solo event. But I'll tell you why. And there's a, actually a very good reason. Um, she is at Bumsabu right now. She went back to the um, the scene where we spent those 18, 19 months and she actually took Etra with her, uh, and her husband and a few friends. So, uh, she's completely out of satellite range because we don't have the dish that we had when we were at yeah. Amsterdam. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tuck you and I away for just a second. Cause I have a beautiful photo of Bumsabu in the background. And okay. it'll give classrooms a real perspective of this remote trappers cabin. So I'm going to tuck us away just quickly. So that gives you kind of a little peek of the, the the place, the isolation, the backdrop, the northern lights in the sky. I mean, wow, what an incredible place to spend 18 or so months. You know, it was otherworldly um, for us, for certain. And we're still processing the impact of living in such close proximity with all the wildlife and the, and the quiet um, and the northern lights, you know, putting on a light show for us during the polar night. Um, so it was, you know, we were we were very keen observers to changes that are happening. And I just want to say the theme this month um, is a, a huge one. Um, it's a it's a big one for us to tackle and break down so that we can all understand what's happening, not just in the area we are around Bumsabu or where I am in Norway or where people are in North America, but we need to understand what's happening globally, right? So um, it is climate change, without a doubt, is our biggest issue uh, today. And it's fair to say that it requires global solutions um, and that can't happen with all of us. So projects like ours at Hearts in the Ice is, is one way to build momentum and on the ground action, but we also need bigger picture things like new national policies and economic transformations. And these are very, very big issues, maybe too big for us to tackle. 
But I do want to share um, because Hila and I have done a lot of, uh, you know, deep diving into uh, what we care about, what we stand for. And I, and I want to share the four things that we've committed to, the four pillars, if you were, um, that we value and stand for. And number one is what we're doing today. It's joining with you, Joe, and, and sharing platforms like Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. It's outreach and it's leadership, standing up for what we believe in. Um, Joe mentioned that we've been doing some traveling. So we have been speaking at global events like the UN and hosting these calls with experts like Susan Aidy today, which we're so grateful, um, Susan, for, for joining today and connecting all of you that are on the call, classrooms. And it's really impactful when all of us work together to find solutions, right? So um, this helps us act and engage. And this is, this is good. Um, the second thing is protecting polar sea ice and finding ways to adapt. Um, you know, if you're in an indigenous community, you need to find ways to adapt. And for all of us, minimizing further impacts to sea ice, which helps to mitigate, among other things, more disasters um, for the indigenous peoples and local communities, because this, this is a huge issue and they are on the front lines of this change and they are, they've been observers, observers um, for their lifetime. So, and the third thing is, is promoting citizen science, which is all about um, advocating for being a lifelong learner and staying curious. So um, I think that Teela and I are living proof of how important it is to, to stay curious and continue to peel back the layers and learn. And the last one, which is really important and relates to all of us, uh, the other three do too, is stand up, stand up for what you believe in. Um, and we are doing that by being ambassadors for the polar regions and for companies that support solutions towards an energy shift. Because right now, uh, if we keep sending carbon emissions up there, um, we are going to see more disasters and problems. So uh, all of us can actually really, you know, take a stand by looking at who are the big polluters and um, look at where you shop and how you move around and, and the choices you make. So the bottom line is we all share the world, don't we? So it's up to us to protect it. So um, I just want to say, Joe, thank you for hosting this call today and a huge thanks to um, what I consider and what many in the industry consider a polar legend. And that is Susan Aidy. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Amazing, Sunova. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, I think students sometimes feel maybe small in their classrooms, like individual actions don't make a difference, but individual actions when hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of students are taking those individual actions, it can have a really big impact. So small changes in your classroom, small changes at home, they can add up when lots of people uh, are taking part around the world. Power of one. All right. Well, Sunava, I'm going to tuck you away temporarily. We will bring you back in shortly. Before I introduce Susan, just a reminder that if you're tuning in via YouTube, let us know where you're watching from. Introduce yourself. Of course, you can send some questions in there questions for Susan, and then of course, questions for Sunova as well. If you wanna know more about what it was like living in a Trapper's Cabin in Svalbard with polar bears as your nearest neighbor uh, and doing all kinds of great citizen science activities. So uh, as mentioned, we've got Susan Addy joining us. She has an exciting career exploring our planet. She spent 30 years at sea and has been an expedition leader for several hundred expeditions to Antarctica, the Arctic and beyond. So she's been able to lecture as a naturalist in wilderness areas around the world, like the Amazon, Galapagos, the South Pacific, Madagascar, South America. And this is pretty incredible. She's been honored with the naming of a cove after her. Uh, Eddie Cove on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula. That's pretty darn amazing. So I'm going to bring Susan in live with us right now. Hey, Susan, how are you? Good morning, Joe. I'm great. How are you? I, I'm great. I'm great. It's It really is an honor to have you joining us today. You have experienced our natural world in a way that, that many people haven't been able to, but you're also bringing it back to people, not only the guests, but students and others. So uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting to have you joining us today. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, honored to have been invited and uh, to be able to share some of my love of polar regions and specifically Antarctica with you. So thank you so much for that. Um, and happy Earth Week, everyone. A happy Earth Month. Um, I am one of the people on, on the planet, I think, who thinks Earth Day should be every day. So um, happy birthday, uh, happy Earth Day to all of you. And I'm so excited that there's so many students who have joined us today. So 
um, looking forward to sharing. And um, I guess I can just start with my, my, I brought a few photographs that I hope I can um, share. Let's see if we can do this. Uh, tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about the polar world I have seen. And also a little bit about what it means to be an ambassador. Sunava mentioned being an ambassador. And I think that all of us, once we establish this love for any place on earth, for the earth in general, it becomes a job for us, but a job that we do loving, lovingly and willingly to be a ambassador for such an amazing place. So my life on the ice, um, as Joe mentioned, I've been working at sea, mostly in polar regions for the last 30 years. Um, before that, I was working as a naturalist in teaching people about nature, any place I could bring them to. And I was telling someone just the other day, my first experience was with a bunch of fifth graders. And I was working with a, a school, with fifth graders in a school. And it was just fabulous. We developed a birding trail in their um, community and they put up bird feeders and we started doing citizen science and that goes back 40 years when i started doing that the opportunity came for me to go to sea to take on a life oh, let's see how i can do that there we go to take on a life of teaching people who wanted to travel to some really remote places and see what nature was like in those remote places. So I've always been a naturalist. I've always been teaching people about nature. And I've been very privileged to have the chance to be a leader, um, to work with so many fabulous people like Sunova and, and Hilda, and to be able to teach more people about these incredible places. So in the process of doing this teaching, of course, um, I've had experience year after year after year of being in some of the same places over and over again. And with that, we have been able to watch as things change. Climate change has been with us for quite a long time. And it is not, as I think scientists will tell you, it's not really new. It's been happening for a hundred years. Previous to that, of course, climate changing has happened over and over for hundreds of thousands of years, for millions of years. But recently, climate change has been driven by humans. And while it was actually relatively common knowledge in the scientific world 50 years ago, it didn't become common knowledge in all of our worlds until just recently. But in my career, I have been watching climate change um, escalate and watching differences occur locally in Canada or the USA when you're out in the forest or out in the meadows. There are changes we are witnessing there, such as when do its insects hatch and such. But when you're in the polar regions, it seems to be going so much faster and we are seeing many more changes. I think this has driven many of us also to become Antarctic ambassadors. And I'm kind of hoping that some of you who are with us today may become Antarctic ambassadors as well. Being an ambassador for any area involves loving and respecting the area, caring about it and wanting to help it. It involves educating others by sharing your love for a place, a region. And that can be just your backyard it doesn't have to be a polar area. It also asks us as ambassadors to become advocates, in my case and in Sunova's case, become advocates for the polar regions, for Antarctica and the Arctic, and to look for ways that we can protect it, even from our home. And both Joe and Sunova said that small things, even small things, are so important because the power of one, when you add it together, it becomes the power of two and four and six, and it creates movements and changes. So ambassadors, in the case of ambassadors for the ecosystems that we care about so much, we become 
the voices, all of us, we become the voices for those who have less voice. It was mentioned that citizen science is so vitally important, and it is. So citizen science doing, for instance, back to that first project I worked on, which doesn't have anything to do with polar regions, but helping this school develop the bird trail and then bird feeders, they were collecting data at their bird feeders of what species they saw, how often they saw them, even when they didn't see them, you know, that there was no birds here today or something. So citizen science, like, like what's going on in Antarctica is vital for helping us um, share what we're learning to see and learn and use that information to help become ambassadors. And we, I think we are all doing it because of the voiceless individuals who we see in the Antarctic. So I'm sure many of you will ask me is, you know, Susan, have you seen penguins? And I would say we see penguins every day when we're in Antarctica, um, even into the Ross Sea. So as a guide, as a naturalist, I have visited mostly the Antarctic Peninsula, but also had the opportunity to get to the Ross Sea. I also helped discover the colony called Snow Hill, which is one of the furthest north colonies of emperor penguins. And emperor penguins are dependent upon the sea ice. Suniva mentioned the sea ice, and that sea ice is a platform because this is the only bird on earth that doesn't require land for breeding. They do not go onto land to build a nest. They use the sea ice. So the sea ice is vital to them. This little chick started its life on the feet of the emperor penguin. In fact, I'm sure many of you have read about it and studied it already, but this bird among other creatures, is really dependent upon the sea ice. Other species of penguins, like the Adeli penguin, they are dependent on the sea ice as well, and in a slightly different interesting way, because they feed along the edge of the sea ice in their off-breeding season. So they never really leave Antarctica, but they utilize the edge of the sea ice for resting, and they also find their food source there in the winter. So again, the sea ice is very important to them. This is chinstrap penguins. They nest on land like the Adelie and some other species of penguins. If there is sea ice in the way of their access to their nesting site, it slows them down a wee bit, but it can slow them down to the point of blocking their access to their nesting site. So it's quite interesting because there's a fine line of in the spring or summer month months that there should be sea ice and then there shouldn't be sea ice. So the change in when we have sea ice becomes very important. And that is also connected to climate. So it's a little bit of a twist in this case, but still and sea ice is very important. Gen 2 penguins are probably one of the more common ones for us to see. But what we have been seeing with all these species is that their primary food, which is krill, is also dependent upon sea ice. So again, here's this connection. Everything is connected. They need the sea ice because the sea ice helps to provide a, uh, a place for, for krill to get its life started, a hiding place from predators like penguins, and also helps to monitor the water temperatures and what's happening in the sea column just below the sea ice. There's other species of wildlife we see in Antarctica too. And we see in some cases, there are changes in their population. This is called an ivory gull. And I think it's obvious why it's an ivory gull, all brilliant white except for its beak, eyes, and feet. 
which are hiding in this particular photograph. And the ice in Antarctica also provides a platform for seals. All seals give birth on the ice. And so the ice becomes incredibly important to the seal. They cannot give birth in the sea. So they come out on the sea ice and use that as a breeding platform. We find the same thing in the Arctic region as well. I think you probably know who this seal is. This is a leopard seal and a very important predator. You all know about the food chain and you all know how connected everything is. So this particular ice seal, the leopard seal, is very important in that food chain. Other creatures also are vitally important in that food chain. And this is an orca, an orca that is hunting Adelis. Sorry, we do see these guys eat the penguins. Everyone loves a penguin, but everybody loves an orca, to, orca and a seal as well. So we have to keep, a, we keep a lookout for these things. But again, when we see changes in the ice, we see changes in, for example, the escape route for an Adeli penguin, or again, breeding area for a polar seal. This is a humpback whale. I'm not sure if you can actually tell by looking at it what it is, but it's a humpback whale, breaching humpback whale, as a matter of fact. And humpback whales are with the seals and with the, uh, the orcas, excuse me, they are top predators. And many of them are dependent upon this creature, the krill. This animal is, we call it shrimp-like because it really looks like a shrimp, is about the size of my thumb. And there are more krill in the Antarctic waters by weight than there is any other living thing which blows my mind. Krill, to reproduce, are extremely dependent upon water temperatures. And changes, just one degree, two degree, three degree, can disrupt their breeding abilities. And if that happens, then we have disrupted the food chain for the entire fauna or the, the animal life of Antarctica. So we have seen changes in the air and water temperature. Warmer water creates more wind and we have more wind coming now. We have more snow, believe it or not, more snow falling in Antarctica along the maritime ecosystems where these animals are found. And that more snow can delay breeding season and can actually destroy breeding success for some penguins. And we have seen those changes already. They are happening. And we're also seeing things like waterfalls where we see melt coming off the glaciers. And also rain because the temperature is so warm. So we've already started seeing the changes. Um, it's hard to watch sometimes. I have complete faith that humanity could change this if we have, I guess, a consolidated effort. As Suniva was saying, we need governments, we need businesses, but we need all individuals, including you guys sitting there in class today. We need everybody on this bandwagon to make it happen. I could go on and on and on. This is a beautiful iceberg that's come off of one of the glaciers in Antarctica. There are so many beautiful things to see. Um, it's sort of beyond belief what is there. I would say otherworldly. People ask me, oh, what's it like to go to Antarctica? And it's really hard to describe it because it's not like any place else on Earth. So I'm sort of at a loss for words. It's beautiful. And it's just, um, yeah, magic, I guess. So helping out at home. There are so many things you can do. One thing you can do is stop using so much plastic, especially one-use plastic. It's made from fossil fuels. So just using plastic creates a carbon issue. Picking up waste. We are starting to see plastic waste in Antarctica, even little microchips. And it's really, really upsetting but it's really difficult for the environment. And working together with other people. 
to help do this, you know? So your whole school, your whole classroom could take it on. It would be fantastic. If you do, please share with us, let us know how you're, how you're doing that. And we would love to tell the world how that's happening. We're celebrating an Antarctic Ambassadorship Day on April 25th, just around the corner, part of our Earth Day celebration. And we would love to have you join us with that. So Joe, uh, Suna, I think I've spoken enough. If, um, if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, amazing. Thank you so much for taking us into that world a little bit. It really, I, I mean, Sunova would probably eagerly agree with you. It's a beautiful world. It's an amazing world, uh, our polar regions. And uh, personally, you know, I love the leopard seal. I <laughs> That's something I would love to see one day as a leopard seal. It's in your future, Joe. Um, you know, Susan, thank you. And I just want to, I just want to share, um, cause it just struck me and that, uh, you know, I've spent so many years on and off in the Antarctic and Hilda has done the same in the Arctic. And, um, you've had, you know, your entire career, Susan, in the Antarctic in and around the Antarctic. And, you know, um, I feel like I've had the privilege of hanging around very smart, dedicated people like yourself. <laughs> and so we get to, you know, we get to create a, all these, we pull in all these pieces of information from scientists that are studying their area of specialty and, you know, and so on. And then they all add up and you think that they're very specific to the Antarctic until you understand that all of these things are connected to an entire global ecosystem. And that's what we know today to be true is that everything is connected in this amazing web. Um, so thank you for sharing what you have. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Awesome. Well, classrooms on YouTube, use that chat sidebar, send us in some questions. I'm going to start bringing in some of our camera crew to ask them some of their, or let the students come up and ask some questions. Uh, anything's fair game for Sunova about her time at Bump Sabu in Svalbard living in the mm -hmm. Trapper's Cabin for Susan about uh, being in the polar regions, particularly Antarctica. Maybe you have some questions about the, the marine life, the land, uh, or climate change in general, all fair game. So uh, let's start off. We'll go to some grade fours who are joining us. They are uh, in Toronto, Mr. Botch's crew. I'm gonna bring them in now. Hey, Toronto, how are we doing? Good, thanks. Here's Patricio with the questions. All right. What is the largest recorded species, I mean, recorded group of penguins? Oh, wow. That's a trick question. Um, I believe the largest colony of penguins, if that's what you're asking, breeding colony, would either be on Cape Adair or Cape Hallett in the um, Ross Sea sector of Antarctica, which is south of New Zealand. And I believe that the population in that, in one of those breeding colonies is somewhere around 250,000 pairs of nesting Adelie penguins. And a very interesting thing about that, that colony is that scientists have drilled into the land beneath that colony and they have, I, I can't remember how many feet they've gone down, but they have gone down sampling the decayed dead penguins of the past. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's a little gross, but science can be that way sometimes. And they have found that the, that, 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 that colony, excuse me, they have found that colony has been there at least 1200 years. Wow. That's amazing. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. Really cool. And I know, you know, it's really hard to get an exact count, uh, but we had a really cool event a few weeks ago with walrus from space where they're using satellites to count walrus from space uh, in the Arctic. And I, I know, I think they use the same in Antarctica to try and spot some of those colonies to, to further explore. I think you can see the guano on the ice, the stain on the ice, and that gives them an idea of where a colony might be. Absolutely, that's been a, a very important tool. Um, and they can also size colonies. That um, the particular 
Colony I was talking about, both Cape Adair and Cape Hallett um, actually are, are on, flat, um, on flat terrain until you get to the wall, uh, a rock uh, geological formation that, and they go up that wall so far. It's just an incredible colony to see, amazing. All right. Uh, we're going to bring in another camera classroom here, then we'll grab a few from YouTube, so we'll mix it up a little. Uh, Ms. Nostro's crew is joining us. There's some third graders. I believe they're hanging out in California, so let me bring them in. How are we doing today, everyone? Say hi. 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 All right, we have a question from Santana. She's going to step up. Awesome. Hi. Um, what's the coldest temperature in Antarctica history? Whoa, another stump the chump question. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to keep coming. <laughs> I think so. So um, in recorded history, I believe the lowest temperature was somewhere around minus 70 Celsius at Vostok Station. So not even at the exact South Pole but at the Russian research base called Vostok Station. So you can Google that. Of course, you can Google anything, but Google that. And I'm pretty sure you'll find out it was 69 degrees, minus 69 or minus 70, somewhere in there. So and what, uh, I was going to ask what temperatures were you and, and Hilda dealing with in uh, uh, Svalbard? Yeah, and and I I do want to add that the the coldest um, I've experienced in Antarctica was at the South Pole. It was minus seventy six um, Fahrenheit, um, and that that's that's just you know things don't work. But in um, at Bumsabu, we the coldest for us was minus thirty four Celsius, um, and that's minus the wind chill. We had some nasty. Um, I, I mean, it's just beautiful. I, I, nasty because it ripped the door off and other things. Um, hurricane winds when we were there. So um, our extremes are in the polls. All right. We've been going to grab a couple questions from YouTube. Then we'll come back to some of our camera classes. Uh, Miss Patrick's crew is joining us from Pennsylvania today, some second graders. And this would be a great question for both to answer. They're curious. Now we're going north. They're curious about your favorite animal in the Arctic. Oh, um, wow. Well, um, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it might sound so it, I, like I love the wildlife in the Arctic just in general, but, um, I have to say, and I don't mean to sound this to be cliche, but having had some very close polar bear encounters, um, and watching them from afar, living the cycle of life uh, and having that play out through an entire afternoon. Um, I just have deep respect for, for those marine mammals um, that we call Ursus maritimus, the polar bear. Um, I think they're both uh, indicative of everything that's happening as it relates to the sea ice and what they depend on, which are the seals for their food. And I don't know, they just t they tell the story and they are just magnificent creatures. Um, and also scary. <laughs> so from my perspective, um, I've spent a lot of time, I've, I've been very lucky to do full circumnavigations of the Arctic Ocean. So Russia, um, Scandinavia, Greenland, uh, Svalbard, like Sunova and, and Hilda. Um, and I often get that question, what is your favorite? And I honestly don't have one. And I have to say that the, what I have witnessed of wildlife in polar regions, the incredible, I have my snowy owl on t-shirt today, <laughs> the incredible adaptations that all wildlife make to survive and be so successful in the Arctic, in Antarctica, in anywhere really, but the white coloration of beluga whales living in that, the temperature of the, of the ice they live in. The resilience of the bears, oh my gosh, incredible. The snowy owls and the migration they do to find food so they can be successful year round. And then there's this little tiny caterpillar called the woolly bear caterpillar that takes seven years to become a moth, a moth, so it can reproduce. And that to me is just fantastic. Then you see a flock of snow buntings and your heart melts. These little black and white birds that look like snowflakes. 
you know, or, or a little snowstorm flying through. Uh, so sorry, I don't have one favorite. That's okay. No problem with that. It's 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 uh, a hard question uh, <laughs> to answer. Uh, we're gonna grab another YouTube question, then we'll visit our camera class, some of our camera groups again. Uh, Miss Chilcott's group is joining us from uh, Vista, California, and they're curious. Now, obviously, COVID would have changed things a little bit, but how often do you find yourself in the Antarctic region? So um, traditionally, I was working every year in Antarctica for two to three months, sometimes four months. And then, um, of course, COVID hit and um, things have changed. But prior to that, for the last 25, 26 years before that, it was uh, up to four months in the summer. I did not do what Sunova did, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Mr. Botch's crew, let's bring you back in from Toronto if you have a follow-up question for us. Um, how many species of penguins are there? Well, thank you for that question. Um, it depends because we have what's called in our scientific communities, we have the lumpers and the splitters. And so in general, I would say there's 17 species. However, there are a few scientists who say that, for instance, the rockhopper penguins, we've always thought of rockhopper penguins as being the same species everywhere you see a rockhopper penguin. But there are some scientists who say, no, no, no. The ones that are breeding on a particular island are actually different from the ones that are breeding over on that island. So they are a different species. And they're separated by thousands of miles, these rockhopper penguins. So some people say there's 19 species, and some people say there's 17 species. OK, we uh, have a question here from a th classroom. They were on camera with us, but they had to duck out early. But they, say, they sent a question in the chat. Uh, they're from New Jersey, and they're going to check out the recorded answer later. Okay. But they would like to know. Uh, you mentioned seeing plastic and other garbage in the Arctic, in the Antarctic. So they're wondering, there's not a lot of people there. Where is that garbage coming from? How is it getting there? So if I can jump in and answer the Antarctic one, Sunova, I think if you could grab the Arctic one, I think that would be awesome if you don't mind. Um, but the Antarctic one, to, to, th to begin with, um, the world's ocean is one river. It moves constantly, always, around the globe. So when it visits your shore in New Jersey, or you visit the shore in New Jersey, if you drop something off that beach in New Jersey, or in a river up, upstream in New Jersey, it gets carried down to the sea. The sea, being a river, our ocean being a river, moves from New Jersey to my goodness, Norway, to France, to Japan, something that drops in the river in Japan, the river of the ocean, moves with the ocean. And it takes a long, long time for it to drop out or settle out. So the currents that take water around the world take plastic pollution with it. And we have started to see where some of that is drifting into or getting sucked into by the currents around Antarctica, getting sucked into Antarctica. We have done um, sampling, water sampling, uh, to look for microplastics, and we are starting to see microplastics in Antarctica. There are a few fish fishing vessels, and there are a few um, other sources, but most anybody who travels into Antarctica is very, very, very careful with any kind of trash. So most of it's coming from outside of Antarctica. And I would say the same is true for the Arctic, actually. Um, it's really striking, you know, travel is is um, a luxury for, for those of us who travel. Um, and that's changed because of COVID in terms of, you know, why we should travel. So a lot of tour operators that visit Svalbard um, have adopted into their um, 
their, um, what should I say, their mandate, if you will, for engaging the passengers is cleaning up along the shores. And you're thinking, well, you can't possibly <laughs> have things to clean up in Svalbard. And it's astounding. Um, you know, at Bamsabu, when we're 140 kilometers away from the town of Longyearbyen, right? Um, you would think that we would see nothing but a wide open uh, landscape. Well, we drove um, up the hill and then to the other side of the open sea. And there, sure enough, along the shoreline, and some of it's frozen in the, um, in the ice, but some of it was not because it gets washed up if we have an open fjord or open sea. We saw all sorts of marine debris, like you mentioned, Susan, that we find all over the place. And it's because of the circumpolar current. Um, and it's we found um, shoes. We found all sorts of plastic bottles. We found um, buoys. We found marine netting. We found, I mean, there, there were heaps, huge, big, tons of garbage bag. We collected quite a bit of it. Um, and what they do is they take that back to, um, to Long Irbian. Um, it gets picked up by the helicopter at certain times throughout the year and they take it more ship if that was happening, but it wasn't, um, last couple of years and they take it back, they sort it and they try to find out the source of that trash to trace it back. And so much of it comes from the maritime industry. Um, that circumpolar current was so strong though, that it brought in a lot of, um, a lot of wood, uh, from Siberia that washed up on the shore that we actually collected and then hauled back with our snowmobile to Bumsabu that we cut up with a chainsaw and um, and then with an ax for firewood for us. So some things that, that throw up on the shore are, are good, like the wood for us, if we didn't have any other food source, uh, heat source, but most often than not, it's just, um, it's just astounding how much gets tossed up on the, on the beach, on the shoreline. Um, so there are a lot of cleanup projects that happen in Svalbard as a result. And I think we're going immersed in, in earnest with that. And Susan, you have to remind me when the, the huge project, the beach cleanup will happen in honor of Sarah. So thank you very much for asking. Um, the, um, it, I wanted to add um, that the industries, our industry, we are a travel tourism industry that brings people to these areas. And as a united group, we are very concerned about plastic, and about our impact. And so we are mandated to have no more than a minor or transitory impact when we travel and to give back. So picking up trash becomes a, a standard operating procedure on every voyage we take. And we do pick up tons of trash. And each year, um, June 16th, we have a week dedicated where our industry, wherever we are at the time, we will go and we will pick up trash to honor a young woman, Sarah Ofra, who was on her way to Nairobi to present to the United Nations Environment Program about our projects called Clean Seas that we have been practicing for many years. Um, Sarah was lost in the Ethiopian air crash and we honor her every year. Um, picking up trash, which is exactly what she would want us to be yeah. doing. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Hanostro's crew, let's grab one more question from our student. All right, I have Annabelle here with her question. <laughs> what if the wet, the climate gets too hot there? Can you repeat your question, please? Well, if the climate gets too hot there, what will happen then? Mm. So sadly, what is, what is occurring, and we're seeing it already, is loss of ice, melting of ice. And if the climate continues to heat at the rate it's going, and that ice melts, it will add huge amount of water to our oceans. It will change the temperature of the water in our oceans. And obviously the air temperature will have changed quite a bit to make that ice melt. So it will be devastating. It will have an impact we would struggle to recover from. So the most important thing is how do we stop it? And what can we do? And I would 
love to share some ideas I have that you guys can get involved in um, because I don't want to think about if that ice was all to melt, regardless of if we're talking about the Arctic or the Antarctic. It's, uh, it would be devastating. All right. Uh, we're just about at our time for today. I can't believe how fast these events go. But I do want to squeeze in a question here from Miss Ferguson's crew who's tuning in from California. And you mentioned humpback whales. And uh, I know during the right season when there's the krill is plentiful, there's a big migration of whales from all parts of the ocean down uh, to those northern regions to take advantage of that. So they'd love to know, can you put a, an estimate on the amount, the number of humpback whales you've been lucky enough to see? Oh, <laughs> the number <laughs> of whales I've actually seen has been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, and I think the documented uh, numbers that are, are uh, uh, what's the word, documented by photo identification through the humpback whale catalog called Happy Whale. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that they now have something like 1,400, 1,600 whales documented. And the International Whaling Commission, which has now been changed to the International Whale Commission, they also have photo ID. And I think their numbers are right around under 2,000. Um, however, that's only what's been photo identified. So there's probably plenty more there and with more eyes more tourist ships traveling to antarctica we actually we're seeing more so we're able to contribute more to the science and understanding of how many whales there are and how frequently they come and go um from you know you were you were saying they come from different places of the world most of the antarctic whales come from south of the equator so they are southern hemisphere whales and um, yeah, we've been able to, you know, document a huge number of them on um, on both all sides of the Antarctic. Somebody was was sneaking in a question earlier about what's the biggest animal in Antarctica, and that would be the blue whale, which is the biggest animal that there has ever been, is the blue whale. Um, so anyway, Joe, if I could just take one moment, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to the town of Bryson City, North Carolina who has very kindly loaned me a part of their library so I could be with you all today. So Bryson City Library, thank you so very much. All right, amazing. Well, I wanna start off with uh, obviously a huge shout out to our classrooms. Thank you to the YouTube classrooms and sending in your great questions. Thank you to our camera classrooms, as always sending in awesome questions. Uh, Sunava, it is great to see one half of Hearts in the Ice. Or maybe one third, because Etra, we can't leave Etra out. Etra is definitely a very important member of the team. Can't leave her out. Indian. Yeah. And, um, you know, April 16th, which is around the corner, three days away, it's Citizen Science Day. Um, and so I, you know, um, we have a little page on our heartsintheice.com website um, forward slash citizen science. Um, there are some couple of, there are a few apps on there, but, um, you know, Susan, you were talking about the ice, or the, the great question that came from the student about what happens when the ice, and in the Arctic, um, one thing we were doing as citizen scientists was collecting um, phytoplankton for Fjord Phyto, which is a citizen science project that is being done on a lot of these expedition cruise ships in both polar regions. And the phytoplankton, if a lot of ice melts in the Arctic, and you're pouring fresh water into salt water, well, the phytoplankton don't thrive in fresh water. So they're the like the they're the little organisms that are responsible for over 50, 60 percent of our oxygen in the atmosphere. And if we lose the phytoplankton, we are in big trouble. So get on to Happy Whale as a um, as a citizen science project or um, a Fjord Phyto or Aurorasaurus. I mean, they're a size starter. There's lots of great apps. So Stay curious and get out there. Joe, you're, yep. There we go. Uh, and Susan, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking us into your world as a polar ambassador uh, and introducing that amazing part of the planet uh, to our, our students today and how it's changing. It's been my pleasure. I couldn't be happier. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you. thanks again, everyone, for joining. We'll actually be live again with Hearts in the Ice tomorrow. And Seth, Seth in Canada will talk to us about how we can mobilize 
uh, to act now and start making big changes uh, right. for climate change. So I do hope you'll join us tomorrow. Same channel, join in, uh, or you can find the event on our website at exploringbytheseat.com. For now, though, we're going to sign off and a big shout out again to everybody for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks.